Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 150. Today's guest is an actor of stage and screen. He's appeared in over 40 stage productions on and off Broadway, including the Tony Award nominated Taste of Honey. He co-starred in Barbershop and Barbershop 2. You know him from Sunshine State, The Key Man, Ray Donovan, and Medical Police. And of course, he played Mr. Morgan, George's co-worker with the New York Yankees in four Seinfeld episodes. Please welcome Tom Wright. Tom, thanks for joining. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's nice to be here. <laughs> Uh, this is great, Tom. So take us back 29 years ago. Yeah. The the Pledge Drive aired on NBC. Tell us a little bit about how the role of Mr. Morgan, that you played incredibly well, uh, came about. Was was it an audition process? We'd love to hear about a little bit of uh, how that iconic role came to be. Well, the, the, the way it happened was uh, was through an audition. Um, uh, I, I went over to M- MTM Studios, which is in Studios uh, in uh, sort of Studio City, and uh, walked into an office with a bunch of Seinfeld writers and Larry David, and um, and uh, uh, Andy Ackerman was the director, who was a really nice guy. L- Larry was, was was shakes you a little bit to your core when he when when he gives you a note. Uh, because he's, uh, he's extremely smart, but, but he like but he barks a little bit. So he gave me a note during, during the audition. Um, uh, I played it and, uh, the next thing I know, I got a call and I, and I got the job, but the, the basis for the character for me always was, um, if, if you remember one of the best slow burns in Hollywood, one of the guys who did it the best was Oliver Hardy. You know, yeah. whenever Stan Laurel would do something stupid, Oliver Hardy would just sit there and then go. <sighs> and, you know, I sort of took that as an inspiration and sort of planted it into Morgan. Yeah. And that's what Costanza, obviously, always foiling your plans, always, always. You know, kind of like your nemesis. <laughs> just like, yeah, you're screwing me again, Costanza. Um, yeah, that's great. And you mentioned, um, you know, the audition and then the writers in the room. It, we, you know, it's very interesting. All four of your episodes written by the same writing team, uh, Gamel and Prose. Right. Um, we just found that we found that fascinating. They kind of they kind of brought you back. They, they must have really liked your character. I, I, I mean, w- what can you tell us about um you know, how that came about where, you know, the recurring role, did you know that going in? Did you think it was just going to be a one-time gig with, with the pledge drive or, you know, I thought how did they a, keep bringing you back there? I thought it was a one-time shot. I, I thought that, uh, you know, I would go in and, and we do the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the candy bar with a knife and fork gag. And, and, and that would be it. Um, but then they called back like uh, a couple of weeks later to a few weeks later and, and, and said, look, we got another episode for you. And they just kept calling, which, which, which was, which was great. Um, uh, I mean, I tell everyone it's the easiest job I've ever had. There's, there's never been another gig that, that's been as, that, that fit just like a slipper. And I really think that I really got to thank Larry David uh, because he is the genius behind the uh, the operation. Um, uh, you know, Seinfeld worked differently than a lot of other sitcoms. A lot of other half hour shows, you know, you come in for a, a, a table read on a Monday and everybody reads the script and people laugh and all the jokes get cracked. And then, you know, you come in Tuesday and then you come in Wednesday. And by the time you get to Thursday or Friday, you've beaten that horse to be to, to an inch of its life. And and the jokes that were really funny on a Monday are necessarily not funny now on Thursday in front of the network. And people panic and they start sort of making like, you know, bad uh, Band-Aid gags to 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 sort of fill those slots where the, where the good stuff was. But on Seinfeld. We'd come in on Monday and we'd read through the script and then you left until Wednesday. You didn't even come back Tuesday to work on it. And what they did was they they locked down the writer's room and they hashed out the script, all of its faults, all of its strengths. And so they locked it. By the time you got to doing the same script Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday night for two live audiences, it was like a one act play. Everybody knew all the beats. Everybody knew all the gags. Everybody knew exactly kind of where, 
where, where, where the sweet spots were. And because Jerry was so, you know, magnanimous and, and, and anybody who could get a laugh, he was all for it. Uh, it made the job really easy. So uh, you mentioned Larry and uh, you're wearing a Yankee hat, of course. You're a you're Englewood guy, right? Growing yeah. up. Yeah. Were you were you a Yankee fan growing yeah. up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. so and this just just fit perfectly then, obviously. I'll I'll tell you how full circle this is, you know. Um um my last straight job, uh, you know, when I was a struggling actor in New York and waiting tables, my last straight job was was uh as a waiter in the stadium club in Yankee Stadium. Oh nice. In nineteen in nineteen seventy nine. And in seventy nine I was the kid on well, my first day of work on opening day and they said look you're low man on the totem pole you go upstairs and serve george steinbrenner a, a, a private party so I was wow like, oh, right <laughs> you know, so, so so i'd go upstairs in the steinbrenner suite and his Stein, steinbrenner suite you know yankee stadium is sort of shaped like that and right where my thumbs meet is his home plate he had the perfect vantage point in on the mezzanine so i walked in his office and I wound up serving a, a a party for three people: George Steinbrenner, Kirk Douglas, and Tom Carvel of Carvel Ice Cream. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible! And, and wow! And you know, Steinbrenner would 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 be on the phone. I mean, he was a maniac. He'd be on the phone, like screaming at Bob Lemon, who was the coach. You know. I told you, Tion is fat. He's too fat to be pitching on my team. Get him <laughs> off the goddamn mound. You know? <laughs> and, and and I'm just a kid. I'm back there, you know. Um, you know. So so so, Mr. Carvel, how do I how do I cut an ice cream cake? <laughs> you know. Uh, but but so it's kind of come full circle. Plus, I was a Yankee fan. My dad took me to a bunch of Yankee games when I was a kid. Ah, oh, that's after, amazing. Uh, and then. And then obviously your episodes were so entrenched with the big Stein himself and Larry played him. Um, so the addition, you mentioned Larry. Well, yeah. What were some of those, those like, actually, no, I'll take this back. So you were, I mean, you probably around 40 when you got the role, right? So you were really entrenched in your career yeah. and Seinfeld was at that point, it was season six. It was on Thursday night. It was, you know, on all kicking on all cylinders. But you mentioned Larry. What did you know about him? I mean, us watching live, you know, we never heard of Larry Day. We hear about him now with Curb. But what did you know about him? Was there? Uh, well, I, mean, I thought. I mean, I was on that show on and off for a year and a half, and 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 for the first year, I thought the I thought Larry hated me. Really? <laughs> you know, I, I I thought it. You know, I just thought, boy, I I really got to step softly around this guy. But he's he's just a, a, he's he's a lot like his Kirby enthusiasm character. I mean, that's sort of a of a of a how should I say a a an overblown example of of a certain side of his personality. But but I found out through having a side conversation with him uh, um, at the craft service table that he was indeed a fan of mine and and. Um, I, I, he just he just really had his finger on the pulse of what on, on the essence of what that show was about and and um he also was very careful about not allowing it to to venture into to 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 broad sitcom he he really wanted it to remain a cerebral sort of exercise in in human pathologies you know and and uh you know i have nothing but mad respect for the guy yeah yeah we, we agree too as far as that goes i mean you were there for with him there right six and seven he was still there and kept the show what it was at its core and a lot of that is is costanza right i mean a lot of that larry's writing costanza and, and you had a lot of interactions with with Costanza, as you mentioned earlier, he's always foible in your uh, your plans. Um, what can you tell us about working with Jason Alexander? I mean, most of your scenes on the set were with Jason, so yeah. I, I'm sure you got some anecdotes or some good stories there around Jason, right? You know, I, I, m most of which I probably have forgotten. But 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 in all honesty, Jason was was extremely easy to work with. 
I mean, you know, I'm a, originally a New York theater actor. Jason is 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 originally a theater actor, and 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 actors who are from the theater have 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 a slightly different approach to 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 the work process. And and you know, he was always magnanimous. Uh, you know, he was always you know ready to to to, to run the scene. Um, uh, sometimes a lot of people don't want to run the scene like and and before you actually shoot it too much because they feel like it's going to get stale or they're going to fall into the trap of of doing the same thing over and over but Jason was never like that he was always you know inventive and looking for fun things to sort of to sort of bring to it even during you know just minor run throughs of lines between him and myself um uh so it was, it was, it was, it was, it was and, and besides it really was a two man show with he and I. So we, we kind of got to know each other in a, in a, in a, in a really funny way. Yeah. And I can't believe you were only in four episodes. It, it feels like you were just yeah. kind of part, part of the fabric, you know, and I think that was just the chemistry you had with Jason for sure. So <clears throat> you, four shows, you kicked off with the pledge drive. You mentioned you were a Yankee fan. So you probably, you know, Remember Channel 11, right, with uh, yeah, yes. Scooter and, and Bill White and everything. So that was kind of the whole premise of the pledge drive. George wanted to do things with PBS and you saying, oh, no, we do enough with Channel 11. Like, it, it's pretty cool that you were playing this role that you were just probably so familiar with and could speak yeah. to so easily and so fluently. And Larry's a Yankee fan, the whole thing. But that episode, I mean, jam-packed. You had Danny Tartable, right. Uncle Leo, Mr. Pitt. Rebecca Staub and Kelly Caulfield Park. We spoke with both of them. I mean, they had such a fun time on that episode. Did, yeah. you, inter did you interact with any of the other co-stars, or were you kind of just with Jason on? on oh set? no, no. You know, during during the off times, you know, in which in which we're all sitting around, you know, just hang, sort of hanging out. Uh, I did get to chat up uh, a few people, especially Lynn Lesser. He was, you know, I mean, you know, that guy was was in. Uh, Kelly's Heroes, I think it was. With he's he he Lynn Lesu had been in television and movies. He was one of those unsung character actors that you always that would pop up all the time, like watching W O R TV or, or you yeah. know Million Dollar Movie or or you know. He, he, and so it was really great to sort of just just hang out and talk with him for a while. Um, uh, and, and what was the actor's name who played Mr. Mr. Pitts? He just passed recently. Shoot. Uh, Ian Crombie, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, and he was another, everybody was so seasoned and professional that again, it was the easiest gig I, I, I ever had, you know? Um, and I can tell you, uh, one of the, uh, uh, a couple of the writers I actually got to know pretty well. Um, uh, and, um, um, one, one of the story behind the, where he, where George sort of says, I look like Sugar Ray Leonard. <laughs> and, and I, yeah. and I say, well, I guess we all look alike to you, George. And then he tries to go out and prove that he's cool with black people <laughs> yeah. you know, to me, you know, which, that, that, I think that happened in a, in a, in a sit around, they were just talking about potential episodes and, and somebody said, Hey, doesn't that guy, you know, who's playing Morgan, doesn't he look a little like Sugar Ray Leonard? And someone said, yeah, he, he does. Or, well, how about if, Hey, you know what we could do, and that turned into an episode. The episode that we shot, unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we we did some research. Suppose it was Larry David was the one that said that to Gamel and Pro. So I don't know if that was true. That, yeah, was yeah, I, yeah I, I forget who who it was, but 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 that's what got said. Yeah, it was funny, and and reading some <clears throat> history on that episode. Supposedly, what was supposed to happen, they couldn't they couldn't get Sugar Ray Leonard, but. The story was they were going to demote George to the ticket office, and Sugar Ray was going to pick up tickets at Will Call, but um, I guess they couldn't get him. But I, I love how that that episode kind of ended with the oh, I, I I I think it's I think it's hilarious, you know, with the waiter, yeah, classic, just a classic episode. Um, yeah, so Pledge Drive was first, then Mom and Pop Store. So Mom and Pop Store, if you remember, <clears throat> was the whole John Voight. 
which I believe you worked with on Ray Donovan as well. I was wondering oh, if there was any I did. connection early on there. Yeah. Um, but that was another one where you're like frustrated with George. Like, why is he having a meeting about uh, John Voight Day? Just pure silliness. But, um, but that was another one where, you know, essentially newcomers like Brian Cranston came on the show. Did you get any interaction with Voight or Cranston? Do you recall no, that? No, 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 I didn't. I, I, you know, although you did bring up Danny Tartable, who I actually got to know pretty well. Um, oh, nice. Uh, and we, we met on on you know on doing that uh, doing that show, you know it it was so long ago, and I, I mean the, the, uh, let me just speak about quickly about the, the the reach of Seinfeld. I mean, I was in South Africa on a safari in two thousand and one, and I had one of the guides run up to me and go, I know you. I know where are you? you are from. I've seen on Seinfeld. You are too funny. <laughs> you know? I mean, that show reaches has, has re reaches every corner of the planet and it goes through generations. Uh, you know, the, 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 there are three generations of college kids who love that show. Um, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, and and it's a testament to to, to guys like you who who kind of uh, you know, it, kind of like O'Hara said, it, you, you you were only in four episodes, but it's like you were in a hundred. Like that's how much everyone knows you because we see it all the time. It's embedded in the fabric. And just you working with the Yankees, you're wearing the Yankee hat, telling the story about really working with Steinbrenner. I mean, the way things come full circle. Uh, all your episodes, you mentioned Tartable, and then we go to your last your last episode, the Wink. Uh, you know, you got Paul O'Neill in there. You got Tar. You know, I, I believe uh, uh, Buck might be in there. Um, but you got you got Paul O'Neill. Um, just just everything about the whole the whole Yankee connection is is just is so great. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, what can you tell us about the sort of with that? You know, four episodes, season six and season seven. Did you? Um, you mentioned a lot of interactions with the writers and things like that, but did you go to the rap parties? Were you involved like uh, at either of those two rap parties for six or yeah, seven? Yeah, I, I, I went to the, I went to the one that was uh, season seven. It was Larry's. Uh, I think, I think that was his swan song season. Uh, I, didn't Jerry take over in season eight? Yeah. Yes. Executive yeah, producer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, here's a, here's a good, a, a good, a, a quick story. Um, my memory is shot, man. So I, I can't remember like a lot of the stuff that happened. No, it's, but, you're but, doing great. But but there are there are certain things that are indelib that are indelibly printed on my mind. And one of them was the season seven rap party. It was uh, held at Barker Hangar here in Santa Monica. And um um my wife and I are in line getting food and and who sort of steps you know, between us is Larry David. He comes to get, I don't know, some crab legs or something. And I, and I said, Larry, you know, this is, this is my wife and, you know, my hun, this is Larry David. And she was like, Oh, great. And he was like, Hey, nice to meet you. You know? And, uh, she said, so now that Seinfeld's done, what are you going to do with it the rest of your life? And he, he, he started. He, he almost started to choke because it wasn't a question. I think it was a question that he had been avoiding asking himself. And just innocently, my wife asked him, you know, what are you going to be doing with, with the rest of your life? And it was it was hilarious to watch a Seinfeld moment happen to Larry David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny because you're right. He probably didn't think about it until that moment. And then uh, the rest is history with Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, Brilliant. You know, it took took a while there, but he did he did end up doing something. Um, you know, Tom, what, what can you tell us about um, uh, Daisy Jones in the sixth? In the sixth, well, I know it's a, yeah, a popular that's, book and it's coming out soon on Amazon, right? That's exactly right. Uh, it's it's an Amazon show, um, um, and uh, it premieres March March third uh, or, or maybe March fifth. I, I can't remember which. <laughs> It'll be on Amazon. Uh, it's a it's a show about um, rock and roll music in the seventies in L.A. and um, uh, it, it's it's a lot reminiscent 
of a Fleetwood Mac type type vibe in terms of the interplay between between the band members. And I play a Quincy Jones type record executive uh, <clears throat> named uh, Teddy Price, uh, who is a little down on his luck, hasn't had a hit in a while, and uh, uh, he discovers this band and. Uh, together they put they they, they create this uh, iconic uh, album that 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 skyrockets them to to uh, international fame. Uh, it's it's a really cool series. Uh, the actors actually had to learn to play their own instruments, um, so it's it, it, I think it's going to be a pretty big show. Yeah, look, looking forward to awesome. that. And Tom, what, what's in the water in Englewood, man? Dwight Morrow High School, right? Yeah, that's it. You, you had it. Rick Overton, friend yeah. of the show. You know Rick. Yeah, he came on with us. Um, oh. Travolta. Yep. Richard Lewis, class of 75. Yep. Yep. And I know you're a football guy, so you're going to know this guy, Bruce Harper, right? Oh, yeah. I know, I know Brucey e really well. And don't forget Clark Peters, who he was, uh, he was, he was in The Wire, Treme, you know, a, a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, who else? Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah, for you, uh, for the Jeff fans out there, that's what Fireman Ed always wears Bruce Harper's jersey. So, <laughs> did you did you guys play on the same team? No, Brucey was a little younger. You know, I graduated high school in 1970. I think Bruce came out in seven in 75, maybe 70, 74, somewhere, somewhere in there, maybe even 73. But um, um, I knew him and his family uh, extremely well. In fact, I just saw him uh, when back to Englewood uh, this past uh, June and uh, hung out with him for a little while. He was an unbelievable talent. Yeah. So you got to be a Jet fan then, right? No way. Where, <laughs> Giants? I'm oh. a Giant fan. <laughs> uh, who, all right. Who, who, all right. Who's your, no, who's I'm your just, Yankees? I'm just, I'm just kidding. I, I, the, the, the Jets are okay. I got no, I got no problem with them at all. But I've been a Giant fan. My father took me to the, my first Giant game in 1956. We went to see Charlie Connolly, and and uh, I, I've I've seen I've seen them all at Yankee Stadium. My father had season tickets from 1958 into into the day he died in 2017. Wow! Uh, they were my so wow. so I, I saw Charlie Connolly, Y.A. Tittle, uh, Frank Gifford, uh, uh, Homer Jones, Bob Schnelker. Uh, Sam Huff, uh, you know, you name them. Lawrence Taylor. I, I saw a lot of games as a kid. Who was your Yankee? Is it Nettles? My my favorite, your Yankee, favorite Yankee was, you know, oh, I'll t I got an interesting Yankee story for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you got. In fact, I should go get it and show it to you. Go get it. Uh, pause it. So in 1963, my father came home one day, and he had he he had this book, and he and he gave it to me. And he said, "Take it, go upstairs, put it away, and don't get it out until I tell you." So I'm like, okay. Springtime rolls around. The Yankees are are playing. We're, we're going to head to Yankee Stadium to see a game. I think I can't remember. Maybe they were playing the Tigers or something like that. My father says, "You got that book?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "Go get it." So we go to Yankee Stadium, and I knew my way around the place because we had had season football tickets. We were sitting in the mezzanine section eight. That's where we usually sit. Game's over. Yankees win. Maris hit a home run. Um, I think Mantle hit a home run. Um, so we, we go back up the steps, and I go left to go down in the you know the roundabout down in the parking lot. And my father says, "No, we're going this way." I was like, "Why are we going this way?" So I follow him. We go to the elevators. He punches the down button. We go down to the basement, to the ground floor of Yankee Stadium. We walk out, and there's the field right there. And here's this hallway that sort of loops loops around Yankee Stadium. And we start walking, and he says, get that book out. And he hands me a pen. He, he then took a baggage claim ticket from Newark Airport that was yellow and tied it to his lapel and turned it over backwards. A hundred feet from, from where we were was the Yankee locker room, and the press passes were yellow. So my father just walked past the guard at the gate, and I walked into the Yankee locker room, and I got on one page 
all of these. I got Mantle, Maris, Tony Kubek, Bobby Richardson, Moose Scourin, Elston Howard. Uh, I got Ralph Houck. Um, I got, I mean, I don't, I, if I can find it. Oh, that's an incredible story. Did you, uh, you, did you talk, did you ever tell that story to Larry David? No. Did you ever no. talk Yankees with him? Never. I never, I never, I never, I never had the chance to. It's like Kramer's fantasy camp right there in that book. I mean, see, there's Elston Howard. There's Roland Sheldon. Oh, I, you can't see. You got to change oh, your background. Ah, uh, too bad. <laughs> but, 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 but I got them all on one page, and and you know they were sitting around there in their their jockey shorts and smoking cigarettes and popping pops. I was, <laughs> you know, That's and there funny. was me, this you know, ten year old kid with a pen and an autograph. Uh, wow, man, y your dad is one love, yeah cool cat. Like I love the street that. smarts. That's great. That's the street <laughs> smarts. Hey, if you, if you act like you that you belong there, right? Everyone just kind of. Uh, That's what he did. He just yep. he just acted like he, he he knew what he was doing, and he was a member of the press, and it was a baggage claim ticket from American Airlines. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> Unbelievable! Um, those are great stories, and thanks for. Uh, sharing kind of those some of those yankee memories but um just back to side so yeah the, the so the final episode the wink so you, you, did you know that was going to be your final episode what's interesting is that's the only episode you're in with wilhelm and you know wilhelm is the other he yankee. becomes the other boss right yeah well, tell us like we always think about like what is the org structure of the yankees it was wilhelm the boss and you and george kind of uh th the same level like what did they tell you well, it, it, the, the way I think it was structured is that that uh, I was George's boss. Uh, Wilhelm was my boss, and and then Steinbrenner is everybody's boss, you know. Um, uh, and and I, I knew that it was going to be, you know, just because of the way that that, that I left, that that I knew it was going to be my last episode, um, which which. I felt like I had a great run on, 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 on an iconic show. And, uh, I mean, there were parts of me that were wishing it could go on, but, but I think that given the, the, the amount of stuff that I did get to do and the impact that it did make, um, I was really grateful to, to, to have that much, uh, uh, connection to, to, to the show Seinfeld. Yeah, of course. I mean, you, like we said, you, you're one of the most memorable characters. Everyone loves Mr. Morgan. And, um, you know, the one, one, one character we didn't touch on and maybe remind me of that talking about the wink is, um, you know, we talked about Jason and Jerry, of course. Um, I'm not sure if you had any scenes with Julia, but you did have a scene, I believe, with Michael Richards when they bring in the, uh, the framed, uh, picture. Um, curious, curious on set, you know, you're there for four, four different episodes. You have any interactions with Michael Richards? We've heard, we've heard some, I some great stories about him. I, I I did not have any any uh, on screen interactions except for that one thing where he brings on, where he brings the the, the birthday card in, um, but I did uh, go out to lunch with him once and and you know he was a mercurial sort of sort of individual he's you know sometimes you find artists who march to their own drummer and and um, you know I know that you know he had been through some some uh some difficulty uh for for a period of there with some comments that he made and so forth but i found them to be just just a really shy quiet guy you know that he you know when we went out to lunch uh there was you know he didn't have very very much to say um but he was always very very kind uh so um uh I tell you that cast was 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 a gem, and Julia to, to me, she's one of the funniest funniest um, uh, comic actresses that we've we've ever seen. I mean, you know, she's she's brilliant. Yeah, especially you know, again, a writer a writer's room full of men. The other cast members, all men. Like she really, I mean, she really shined. But um, uh, you know. The beauty of the show, we talked about this, is letting the guest star shine, right? Like yeah. everyone knows, everyone knows Mr. Morgan. Like, and I think that was that's what was great about these guys from Jerry on down. Um, they were willing to, I don't know, sacrifice stealing the show to let you guys shine. I mean, well, they, the, scenes, they were... 
they were very smart. Uh, again, you know, there are so many shows that are centered around, you know, stand up comics um, who 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 are not secure enough in their own uh, abilities. Uh, so they 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 want to make sure that they have all the laughs. They want to make sure they have all the moments and. And there are sometimes on certain shows, you know, when you're a guest star, you actually have to kind of hide, you know, your best choices and save them <laughs> until until the cameras are rolling. Because because otherwise someone will step in and say, no, nah, we don't want you to do that. Or uh, could you could you could you lose this line or, or can you give it to him? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, um, there's there's. But those guys were extremely, um, they were so generous, uh, you know, they were so unsnarky. And because they were New Yorkers, most of them were, and, 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 and really familiar with the, with the East Coast, I felt like I was shooting it in New York. Everybody mm-hmm. always says to me, oh, it's Seinfeld, you shot it in New York, right? It's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> we shot that in LA, but it felt like New York because because of people's sense sensibilities. Yeah, I mean that that Great point that final uh, the final scene of the wink, your last episode with you and the wife, and uh, you know getting massage and George winking. I mean, <laughs> crack of laughing every time, and then just the way you finish it. Tony mentioned it up. He's like, you know, mentioned before you screwed me again, Costanza. Just like yeah. that's. That's Mr. Morgan in a nutshell, right? Yeah, it it was, and it was it was uh, you, you know the the way that line worked out for me was was you know every now and then you 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 get a bit of divine inspiration. You know, you you have a line or you have a speech or you you, you have a, a a a monologue or a scene, and you know you kind of figure like this is how this is going to go. Okay, so you, you you get it plotted out, you rehearse it. And it seems to fall into certain rhythms, and and then all of a sudden, every every now and then, uh, it's 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 what Rod Steiger called when instinct meets intellect. Something comes out of nowhere that fits it perfectly, and you know you go with it, and and it it it, it shines a certain light that 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 is sort of irrefutable, and that line. I originally, in the first take, I think I had done it fairly serious. I was like, "Ah, you screwed me again, Costanza," you know. But so all of a sudden, it dawned on me, you know, may- maybe I could be be amused by that. So it's like, "Oh, oh, you screwed me again, Costanza," you know. Just he's la- he's laughing at his own situation. So that that kind of popped out of nowhere. What when we were doing uh, take two. Um, and and uh, gl- luckily for me, they stuck with it as as uh, the final take. Yeah, I mean uh, that's 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 a great story because it, it's true. I mean that's what you were talking about earlier. I mean that's that's what the show is as far as you know letting the guest start shine. It's those types of things, right? It's it's finding comedy and everything. The whole sh- the whole mantra of the show was you know is it funny? Just be funny. All that kind of thing, right? So having that instinct that you had to kind of twist it and just have that little bit of a humor in it where he just has to laugh at the whole situation that, that just sums it up perfectly. Um, speaking of you know, another humorous thing ever, ever go and eat that Snickers bar with a knife and fork after Seinfeld. Do you ever find yourself just at a nostalgia just to try it out I, again? I, I did it as a gag in a restaurant just, just <laughs> once, just to see, just to see who who, who would react, and, you know, and and I did it really seriously. And the waiters were walking by. A waiter walked by, and he looked at me and, and went over to the other waiter. Says, "Look at what this guy's doing," you know. Then the other waiters would pass by, and I just kept ignoring them, and just to, just to see what kind of reaction it would have. And it was in Chicago when we were shooting Barbershop. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of restaurants, why was Mr. Morgan eating by himself that day when uh, George brought uh, the exterminator? I never understood that one, but oh yeah, yeah, you got me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't ask those good questions. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so you, yeah, you mentioned the barber shop. You've done Star Trek. I mean, you've had just an incredible, incredible career. 
Um, wh what are you most recognized for? I mean, is it Seinfeld? Is it Barbershop? Or Ray it's Donovan? I mean, you've been in so much. I'd say I'd say Seinfeld is probably number one. Um, uh, you know, again, it was like 29 years ago. Uh -huh. I'm still getting stopped by, by, by people on the street. Um, and, and I'd say that, that Star Trek Voyager probably is, is runs number two, uh, where I played Tuvix. Uh, uh, that, that's especially for, for fans of Star Trek. Um, I, I still get mail, um, every week. From from Star Trek fans uh, with with cards and and, and pictures to sign, um, wow. and then sometimes you know, like with an African American audience, it's usually it's usually barbershop uh, and or tales from the hood. <laughs> you know? Detective Williams, there you go. <laughs> In barbershop, for sure. Well, Tom, this this has been great, man. You uh. You were memorable as Mr. Morgan and just thanks. Uh, love your background. Love, love all the work you've done. Really looking forward to, to Daisy Jones and the six and uh, can't wait to see what else you got going on for the rest of the year. So thanks. Yeah, so much. Well, keep, keep stay, stay tuned. And where are you from again? Are you from New York? Yeah. We're, we're both from New York. Yeah. Yeah I'm, in, yeah. I'm in Bergen. I'm in Bergen County now. I was born in Englewood. Oh, and we're, we're, oh, is that right? You know, yeah. and, but did you, did you grow up in in Bergen County? We grew up in Nanuet over in Rockland. Oh, yeah, I know exactly where you guys grew up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Tom, uh, bases loaded, two out. Who do you want up all time? What Yankee? Cleet Boyer. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <It's full. laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a funny story real quick. Uh, this had to be two thousand four or two thousand five. I saw. Tory at the 92nd Y with Bob Costas. They, oh. asked him that, they asked him that same question. This is 2005. Guess who he said? Who? Nick Gary, Gary Sheffield. No, of his like... Oh, is that right? Gary Sheffield? Um, yeah, he, yeah, he had O'Neill, he had Jeter, he had Bernie. He, he picked Sheffield. Couldn't believe it. I, you know, I, in, in all seriousness, I'd probably have to go with with, 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 with Bernie. Bernie had some really, really big yeah. clutch hits. Bernie, Tom, Bernie's we know we love you, man. Yeah, we know you love Bernie. He Finally, had, Bernie he, he had some big, big hits that, that brought the Yankees back from the from the brink of, of failure, you know. Uh, Underappreciated, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. All right, man. Cool. Thank you thanks so, so much, much, Tom. Man. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks really a lot. It. Good to talk to you guys. Right. You too. Cheers.